very high moon button. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. A second salawat for the love of Amir al Mu'mineen. For the hastening of the reappearance of the Imam of our time, a third salawat in the loudest of your voices. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف الرحيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, respected reciters, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The ayah that I just recited is verse 128 from Surah at tawbah And this verse gives probably one of the most beautiful descriptions of the Prophet. You see, there are some verses in the Qur'an that describe the Prophet's relationship with Allah. And then you have verses like this that describe the way that he interacted with people, the way that he saw people. The verse is quite powerful because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he highlights some of the most unique qualities of the Prophet. A quality, qualities that separate him from others. The ayah begins where Allah says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ That verily a messenger has come to you from amongst you. And this is significant brothers and sisters because it's very easy for an outsider to come to a community and deceive and manipulate. 
Because when someone has not grown up in your midst, you don't know their past. They can pretend to have an immaculate past. But it's very different when the person grew up in your midst. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to highlight that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is not a stranger. If you doubt his character, just examine his life with you. This is a man who was born in Mecca. His childhood was in Mecca. His adult life was in Mecca. He got married in Mecca. He had children in Mecca. If there was a single blemish in his character, surely they would have found it. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ He was raised under your eyes. And yet, even his most staunch enemies could not point to a single character flaw. He was among you. You saw him. The same people who later fought him, they are the ones who called him as al amin And even after they wanted to assassinate him, all of their valuables were still with him. Imagine how much trust they had in Rasulullah that he would never betray them. That even as they're trying to assassinate him, Abu Jahal, Abu none of them ever said to the Prophet, give us our money back. They knew that even if we threaten to kill him, he will never do khiyan. He will never betray. He will never violate the trust. And this is why when he leaves, Med he leaves Mecca for Medina, he leaves Ali behind. And one of the reasons why he leaves Amir al-Mu'mineen behind is to return the amanat. To who? To the same people who had expelled him. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Quraysh, the polytheists, Allah is not speaking to Muslims in this ayah. He's speaking about all of those who have experienced the Prophet, all of the people to whom he was sent. He was, he's amongst you. He's a messenger from among you. Azizun alayhi ma anittum. Meaning, Allah says about the Prophet, it grieves him when you suffer. When you suffer, meaning who? People in general. Azizun alayhi ma anittum. This part of the ayah highlights a very unique quality of the Prophet. And that is, not only did he acknowledge the suffering and the pain of people, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Not only did he acknowledge the distress and the suffering of people, because that is what we would call sympathy. When I acknowledge your suffering, that means I'm expressing concern for you. But you have a lot of people who are wealthy and they might have sympathy for the poor, but they've never tasted poverty. Sympathy is to acknowledge the suffering and the distress of others, but from your own perspective. Whereas empathy is to feel the suffering of others. It's your ability to put yourself in other people's shoes. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ, and I say this without exaggeration, he was the most empathetic human being. Why? Because he suffered more than anyone else. You can't empathize with the poor unless you've tasted poverty. You cannot empathize with a parent who has lost a child unless you yourself have lost a child. 
When you look at the life of the Prophet, it's not a coincidence that he is rahmatan lil alameen. It's not a coincidence that he's a mercy to the world. Because he experienced so many different types of hardship that when you look at his life, he was able to relate to almost everybody. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, himself, he says, ما أوذي نبي مثل ما أوذيت. No prophet had suffered as I suffered. This is a man who came into the world at a disadvantage, meaning he was born as an orphan. You know, sometimes we, we mention this and we continue our discussion. But you have to understand what that means, brothers and sisters. To grow up without a father in a time and in a place where everything that you were was dependent on who your father is. It's Arabia, 7th century Arabia is all about who your father is and who the fa father of the father is. It's a tribal society. The Prophet was born into tribulation. He spent a few years with his mother, loses his mother, so if there's any child out there in the world who's an orphan, who's growing up in a home where there's no father, no mother, the Prophet ﷺ knows what you feel. The Prophet ﷺ, that suffering built that empathy. The reason, what makes him great is that he went through all of those trials. If you ever meet a great person, know that that person has suffered immensely. Because you don't get to be great by living a life of comfort. It's impossible. Because suffering, trials, tribulations, they build character. So the Prophet ﷺ, he felt for people. It grieved him when he saw people suffer. Now the question is, my dear brothers and sisters, what creates a truly empathetic leader? And we all need this empathy, brothers and sisters. Sometimes whenever we go through difficulties, we have to remind ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me an opportunity to build my character. Every day, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one thing in Surah Al-Fatiha. What's that one thing? إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ We ask for guidance. Perhaps the suffering that you're experiencing now in your life, whether it's a sickness, whether you're going through a divorce, whether you're having trouble with your children, no matter what it is, Perhaps the answer to that dua, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ is the problem that you're having. Because I'll tell you this, brothers and sisters, you and I, we all know ourselves. If it wasn't for the problems in our lives, most of us would never speak to Allah. We all know it. I say this to myself before all of you. When things are going well, we don't raise our hands in dua. We're just cruising. We forget. Sometimes we become delusional. Sometimes we feel invincible. And I can tell you that nine times out of ten, the most heartfelt supplications you've ever uttered were those moments of utter despair when you felt like the dunya brought you to your knees, that is when you called out to Allah from the bottom of your heart. And that moment, that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether we understand it or not, that connection is worth the dunya and everything in it. So the Prophet sallallahu suffered. And sometimes we're not able to appreciate the ni'mah of hardship. 
Why? Because some of us lack the habits that are needed to develop empathy, to develop greatness. And one of those prophetic habits is what? We need to build self-awareness. You know what makes the Prophet great? Is that no one knew Muhammad like Muhammad. No one knew his soul like the Prophet. Do you think it's a coincidence that the greatest messenger of God was also the one who also spent a lot of time in solitude? Do you think it's a coincidence that he spent all of those weeks and those years in that cave of Hira? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi considered 7th century Arabia to be too distracting. What would the Prophet say about our world today? If Mecca 14 centuries ago, Rasulullah needed a break from it, imagine what type of break we need. Because when you have those moments of solitude, the problem is today, people cannot sit with their own thoughts. You know, oftentimes when I'm at the airport, I like to just observe people just to see how human beings behave. And it's amazing. Very rarely will you see a person just sitting without a phone, without anything. And the reason is because we treat silence and solitude and quietness as if it's some form of torture. What was supposed to be a path for refinement is now a torture technique. People are not comfortable with themselves. They're always trying to distract themselves. But isn't that the problem with human beings? The greatest problem of the human being is ghafla. And is ghafla other than to be distracted? So, when we look at the life of the Prophet, you know, I'm not here to just give you historical facts that the Prophet used to go to the cave of Hira. No, there's a lesson there for you and I. And the lesson is, where is your cave of Hira? The Prophet had a place of quietness. He had a place of silence where he could think about his life, about his future. We need that. Every day, we need to designate five, ten minutes. We all have the time. The question is, is it a priority? Five, ten minutes. Every day, put the phone away. And even if it's the last five, ten minutes before you go to sleep, the problem is we're scrolling through our phones up until the last minute. We treat it as if it's some type of amal that I have to get finished every day. So right now, I want everybody to take out your phones. Take out your phones. What's the shaykh going to do? You'll see. Everybody take out your phones. And don't pretend like you don't have a phone. Every single one of you has a phone. Even the little kids. Take out your phone and throw it up against the wall. No, don't do that. <laughs> what I want you to do is put a notification that you're going to spend five, ten minutes. Maybe start with five. I don't want you to lose your mind. Five minutes of complete quietness. Put your phone away. Now you may say, Sheikh, what am I going to think about? You know what you should think about is what you did that day. That five minutes, do a quick review of that day. What did you do when you woke up in the morning? Did you, did you miss Salat al-Fajr? Yup. Well, you're still young. You're not mukallaf yet, so that's fine. Did you miss Salatul Fajr? Well, that's a problem. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Did you backbite? Why did you backbite? Who are you sitting with? Maybe you need to change your friends. Be more cautious. Did you do a good deed? Did you hold the door for an old lady? That's a good deed. Ask Allah to give you the tawfiq to do more good. These are the moments that separate the goods from the greats. You know, I know I was speaking to some of the youth a lot of you guys like basketball, right? Right. I'm old, so I don't, I'm not familiar with the new basketball players. But back in the day, 
there was a man called Michael Jordan. And he led the league in scoring. I'm going to make a very important point here. I'm not going to just share with you my love for basketball. He led the league in scoring for almost his entire career. Who was second? We don't know because no one remem remembers second place. But I can tell you this. The difference in points is only a few points. He just took a couple of extra shots a game. And that's what separated the good from the great. The point that I'm trying to make is anyone who achieves the highest levels of spirituality, they're the ones that spend those five, ten minutes every day in quietness. They are the ones who review their days. They're the ones who get better. The distance between good and great is very small. But if we can develop these habits, brothers and sisters, you will see a huge change in your spirituality. This is why Imam Al-Kazim alayhi salam la basallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ يُحَاسُبْ نَفْسَهُ كُلَّ يَوْمْ You are not from us, Ahlul Bayt unless you take yourself to account every day. There is going to be a day of judgment. But isn't it better to judge yourself before Allah judges you? Develop that habit. That's number one. Number two, you know, speaking about this concept of self-awareness. So the Prophet was the most self-aware because he spent a lot of time with himself. Pondering, reflecting. And he was a master at self-monitoring. You know, sometimes we say things, we do things without even realizing it. There's a complete lack of self-awareness. Did I say that? Did I post that? Did I make that hand gesture? We're completely oblivious of our own actions. But we're very good at monitoring, monitoring the actions of others. We keep a very close eye on the way that people glance, the way that people walk, what they say. Imagine we applied that same scrutiny to ourselves. To give you a sense of how self-aware the Prophet was, how much he used to monitor himself, there's a beautiful narration from Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. where he says when the Prophet used to sit with his companions, Imam says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ يُقَسِّمُ لَحَظَاتَهُ بَيْنَ أَصْحَابِهِ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ ذَا وَيَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ ذَا بِالسَّوِيَّةِ Imam, he says, when the Prophet would speak to an audience, when he would speak to his companions, he would distribute his glances equally among them. He would look at this person and that person equally. Do you know, brothers and sisters, how much self-discipline, how self-aware you have to be to monitor how much time you're spending glancing at someone? This is jihad nafs brothers and sisters. This is what it means to really watch yourself. There's another story where, you know, the Prophet had this, this very beautiful habit of visiting Jannatul Baqi' after praying Jama'ah prayers with his companions. And the narrations say, and I'll read it to you verbatim, from Abu Imama. He says, So this companion is narrating this. He says, the Prophet one day went to Jannatul Baqir. If you've been to Medina, it's the cemetery that's adjacent to his masjid. He says, we went, the Prophet went to the Baqir, and of course, the Prophet, everyone is following him. He has, you know, his entourage of companions. فَتَبِعَهُ أَصْحَابُ Now, the, imagine this. The Prophet is walking, and he has all of his companions walking behind him. فَتَبِعَهُ أَصْحَابُ Suddenly, 
the Prophet stopped. وَأَمَرَهُمْ أَنْ يَتَقَدَّمُوا He stopped and he told all of his companions who were walking behind him, he says to them, I want you to walk in front of me. And the Prophet was walking in the back. فَسُئِلَ عَنْ ذَلِكَ so someone asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, why did you do that? You were walking in the front, suddenly you stopped and you asked everybody to walk in front of you. Why, Ya Rasulullah? He says, Inni sami'tu khafqa ni'alikum fa'ashfaqtu an yaqa'a fi nafsi shay'un min al-kibr. This is spirituality right there. The Prophet says, the reason why I told you to walk in front of me is because when you were walking behind me, I could hear the tapping of your sandals. You know when you're walking and you have an army of people behind you, it can give you a little bit of a sense that, you know, I'm a, I'm a big shot, that I have this huge entourage behind me. The Prophet he says, I asked you to walk in front of me because I was afraid that some level of pride would enter my heart. No one knew. No one knew what was in the heart of the Prophet. But the Prophet is trying to teach us a very important lesson. And that is, you always have to check your heart. And this is a very important lesson that we need today. Check your heart. You want to post something on social media? Ask yourself, is this truly for Allah or is it for clout? Is it for fame? What is this about? Those routine checkups. We got to check our hearts. Ask ourselves, where is my heart in this moment? This is what made the Prophet the Prophet. Another quality of an empathetic leader is that you have to be a good listener. You have to be a good listener. Today, you know, many people today, they're not good listeners. You know, we know how it goes. We often listen to reply. We don't listen to understand. It's as if, okay, I'm going to let you talk so you finish what you say and then I want to say what I want to say. You know, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ, he was... You know what made him such a great listener? He didn't interrupt people. Tonight, make a promise to yourself that I want to be like my Prophet. When people speak, no matter who they are, I'm not going to interrupt them. Even if they interrupt me, I'm not going to interrupt them. Whether the Prophet was speaking to his commanders, whether he was speaking to his family, whether he was speaking to a child, the Prophet never interrupted people. In fact, the Prophet when people spoke, he used to shift his entire body. You know, if you were sitting with the Prophet and you were talking, he wouldn't turn his head to listen to you. He would reorient his entire body and he would face you with his entire body to give you his undivided attention. Because the Prophet is trying to say that you matter. I am going to give you my full attention because you're a human being. Some of us, we've lost this culture, brothers and sisters. You know, we do all of the a'mal, we're very good at holding the programs, and all of this is important. I'm not trying to downplay the importance of majalis and a'mal. But what's the point of all of this if we're lacking in our adab, if we're lacking in our akhlaq? In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was such a phenomenal listener that the munafiqeen used to criticize him for listening. Because in their minds, a true leader is decisive. A true leader is not going to consult. A true leader is an authoritarian. My way or the highway. Look at what the Quran says in Surah, in Surah at tawbah verse 61. وَمِنْهُمُ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِيِّ And from among them, the hypocrites, 
there are those who seek to hurt the Prophet. How do they hurt him? They used to make fun of the Prophet and they used to call him the ear because of how much he used to listen to people. He would make the final decision, but he would consult. He would listen to people. Number three, you find that the Prophet ﷺ, he had this natural curiosity. He asked about people. You know, brothers and sisters, I've been to many communities and two people, part of the same community, they've been living there for many years. Some of us, we go to our local, our local masjid and we don't even know the names of the people that we pray side by side with. We don't know anything about them. The people that come to the masjid, we treat them like strangers. What's even worse is that we don't ask about people when they disappear. You know, sometimes people come to the masjid and then suddenly they stop coming. And oftentimes what happens is, what do we do? We say, oh, you know what, maybe, maybe they went astray, right? Maybe, I, don't know, I don't know if they're even Muslims anymore. They don't even come to the majalis anymore. We have to ask, why did they stop coming? You know, brothers and sisters, there's a beautiful narration that says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِذَا فَقَدَ الرَّجُلَ مِنْ إِخْوَانِ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامِ سَأَلَ عَنْ The Prophet had a huge community. The Prophet's community was bigger than this community, bigger than my community. The narration says, if someone in the Prophet's community, one of his companions, if they went missing, they stopped showing up for three days, not three months, three days, they're nowhere to be found, the Prophet would ask about them. Some of us don't even recognize when people go missing. Imagine how attentive you have to be to notice that someone is, has been absent. The Prophet would ask about them, and then the hadith says, فَإِنْ كَانَ غَائِبًا دَعَلَ If that person was traveling, Rasulullah would make dua for them. And the Prophet would actually make dua for them. You know, we have this, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but at least it's a, it's a bad habit that I have. I'll make dua for you, please make dua for me. And what happens? We don't make dua for each other. It's just a formality. Please keep me in your dua. No, you keep, you keep me in your dua. I'll keep, you, I'll keep you in my dua. But it's just a formality. We say it and we don't really mean it. The Prophet meant it. The Prophet meant it. And even if you can't remember the person's name, Oh Allah, please forgive and have rahmah upon that person who asked me for dua. The point is, take these things seriously. Three days someone would go missing, the Prophet would ask. If the person was traveling, the Prophet would make dua for them. وَإِنْ كَانَ شَاهِدًا زَارَ If the person was in town, they weren't traveling. Would the Prophet say, summon them, I want to speak to them. The Prophet would go and visit them. The Prophet ﷺ himself, he would go and visit. Look at the beauty, the humility. وَإِنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا عَادًا And if the person was sick, the Prophet ﷺ would go and visit them. Now, I want to give you some examples of the Prophet's amazing empathy. He had empathy with even his enemies. Many of you are familiar with Abu Sufyan. You guys know Abu Sufyan, right? The Prophet's arch enemy who was killed in bed. Abu Sufyan, by the way, Abu Sufyan, you guys know what it means. The father of ignorance, right? It's not an honorific title, obviously. So this is a title that the Muslims gave to him. The father of ignorance. He had a son by the name of Ikrama. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that his son converted to Islam, converted to Islam when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca? When they brought, before they brought Ikrama to the Prophet, do you know what the Prophet said? He said to his companions, don't refer to his father as Abu Jahl. His real name was Amr. Don't call him Abu Jahl. Ya Rasulullah, 
Abu Jahl, he's the son of your arch enemy. He says, yes, but it's still his father. Don't disparage his father in front of him. Allah will judge him. The point is, brothers and sisters, that this is the type of caution the Prophet had with people. There's another narration that tells us that after conquering Khaybar, we're familiar with the Battle of Khaybar, but let me share with you a part of that story that many of us probably have not heard. One of the prisoners in that battle was Safiya, who eventually became the wife of the Prophet. She was a Jewish woman. She was a princess. She was the daughter of the chief of Khaybar, that Jewish fortress. It was conquered. There were casualties. Safiya is escorted by Bilal to the Prophet. Bilal walks her across the battlefield. On that battlefield, she saw her relatives killed on the battlefield. When she arrived to see the Prophet, she was crying. Rasulullah said to Bilal, what happened? Why is she crying? Bilal says, because as we were walking through the bodies, she saw some of her relatives. And the Prophet, do you know what he said to Bilal? Ya Bilal, anuzi'at al-rahmatu min qalbik? You couldn't have taken her on a different path. Why did you have to walk her across the battlefield? Why was the Prophet like this? Because he had empathy. Because he knew what it felt like to see the deceased, the body of a beloved. The Prophet saw Hamza. He felt that. He knew what it felt like. Why, was the pro why did the Prophet so show compassion to Ikrama? Why? The Prophet knows what it feels like to be outnumbered. He knows what it feels like to be an outcast, to be in a position of weakness. Those experiences built within him that empathy. The Prophet empathized with the homeless. Why? Because he knew what it felt like to be homeless. In the Shi'ab of Abi Talib, the narrations say uh, an entire month would go by and the Prophet would eat from whatever grows from the earth. The Prophet knows what it feels like not to have a roof over your head. And this is why in Medina, what does he do in the Masjid of the Prophet? He designates a living quarters for the homeless. All of those trials and tribulations, they built within him that incredible empathy. And the Prophet had great compassion for children. So much so that the Prophet used to do something that was unprecedented in Arabia. He used to actually play with children. And not just for a few minutes. No, the Prophet would really get into it. So much so that some of the companions of the Prophet, they would tease the Prophet. They would mock him for being so playful. On one occasion, Hassan and Hussein were on the shoulders of the Prophet. And they would say to him, they would say to Hassan and Hussein, Ni'mal jamal jamalukuma. The Prophet would pretend to be a camel. He would get on his knees and they would ride on his back. And some of the companions would say, oh, you know, you have, you have a wonderful camel. Teasing the Prophet for his playful nature. And the Prophet would say what? He would say, Ni'ma They're the best riders. Hassan and Hussein. My dear brothers and sisters, in these nights, it's very painful for the family of the Prophet. This man, who was full of mercy, who was full of love. On a night like this, Fatimah al Zahra alayhi salam is sitting beside the deathbed of Rasulullah. Imagine how difficult it was for Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam to fare well, not just her father, but the final messenger of God. The narration say that she would look 
she would gaze into his face. And she would recite poetry that she learned from Abu Talib. She would say to Rasulullah through those lines of poetry, lines that were composed by Abu Talib, that the rain falls from the skies because of the face of Rasulullah. This is the same man who was the protector and the guardian of the orphans. She was reciting poetry that immortalized the Prophet. And this is where Rasulullah says, Bunayya Fatima, it is better for you to recite ayat of Quran that remind the people of my mortality. Rather, I want you to recite Wama Muhammadun illa ya Rasul. Muhammad is nothing but a messenger. The messengers before him had perished. Fatima al-Zahra, she begins to cry. The narration say, Rasulullah, he calls her close to him and he whispers into her ear. He whispers something that makes her cry even more. After a few moments, Rasulullah summons her once again. He whispers something else into her ear and she begins smiling. After the death of Rasulullah, someone asked her, O oh daughter of Rasulullah, what did Rasulullah whisper to you that made you cry bitterly? And what did he whisper to you? What, he, what did he disclose to you that made you smile? She said that my father Rasulullah, he drew, drew me close to him. And he whispered into my ear that, Oh, my daughter, I will not recover from this illness. I will depart this world very shortly. And therefore, when I heard that, I began to cry. But then he called me again and he whispered into my ear saying, Oh, Fatima, grieve not because you will be the first member of my family to be reunited with me. Rasulullah, he summons Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ali ibn Abi Talib enters the room. At this moment, Ali and Fatima are standing beside Rasulullah. Rasulullah, he takes the hand of Fatima. He places it in the hands of Ali. And he says to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Ali, hadhi wa di'ati indak. Oh Ali, this Fatima, this daughter of mine, she is a trust that I am placing in your hands. After a short while, Hassan and Hussein, they enter the room, they climb on the chest of Rasulullah. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, when he sees Hassan and Hussein on the chest of the Prophet, he thinks to himself that Rasulullah is ill. Maybe they're putting too much pressure on the chest of Rasulullah. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he tries to remove Hassan and Hussein from the chest of Rasulullah. He tries to remove them from the chest of Rasulullah. Rasulullah says, Ya Ali, da'huma, ya Oh Ali, leave them. Leave them on my chest. Do not remove them because I want to kiss them. I want to embrace them and I want them to embrace me. Oh Ali, allow them to enjoy me because after me they will be oppressed. 
At that moment, the narration say that there was a knock on the door. Lady Fatima she says that we are not accepting any guests. The knocking continues again. Sayyidah Fatima says that Rasulullah is ill. He is not accepting any guests. At that moment, Rasulullah turns to his family and says that this is not a visitor. This is Malakul Maut. This is the angel of death. Never before has he ever asked permission to enter a room. Nor will he ever ask permission after me. The angel of death enters into the room and sits beside Rasulullah like a humble slave. The narration say that Malakul Maut says, Ya Rasulullah, do you give me permission to take your soul? The narration say, Ya Malakul Maut, Rasulullah says, Ya Malakal Maut, can you give me a few moments because I want Jibra'il to be with me? Jibra'il has been with me all of these years. I want Jibra'il to be with me at this moment. The narration say that Jibra'il descended to the earth and saw Malakul Maut and called out to Malakul Maut asking him, have you taken the soul of Muhammad? The angel of death says to Malakul Maut, I have not taken his soul. Jibra'il says, O oh, Malakul Maut, why have you not taken his soul? All of the malaika are waiting for Muhammad. All of the Hur al Ain are waiting for the arrival of Muhammad. Malakul Maut says, O oh, Jibra'il, Rasulullah requested your presence. Jibra'il descended. Malakul Maut says, Ya Rasulullah, you have a choice. Allah gives you the choice. Do you want to remain in this dunya? You can live for as long as you like. Or do you want to return to your Lord? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, If I remain, what will happen? Malakul Maut says, eventually death will occur. Rasulullah says, إلى الرفيق الأعلى إلى الرفيق الأعلى I want to return to my Lord. I want to return to the loftiest companion. As Rasulullah begins experiencing the pangs of death, his head is in the lap of Amir al Mu'mineen. He places his head in the lap of Ali ibn Abi Talib. There is a sheet that is put over the head of Ali. The narration say, in his final hour in this dunya, Rasulullah whispered to Imam Amir al Mu'mineen. After the death of Rasulullah, Someone asked Ali ibn Abi Talib, O oh Ali, what did Rasulullah say to you in those final moments? What did Rasulullah whisper to you? Amir al Mu'mineen said, Allamani Rasulullah al Fababin min al Il, Yuftahuli min kulibab al Fa al Fabab. Then in that final hour, Rasulullah opened up a, a thousand doors of knowledge. Each door opened up a thousand more doors. Brothers and sisters, for one hour, Rasulullah was in the lap of Ali. Suddenly, after about an hour, Amir al Mu'mineen lifted the sheet and he looked at Fatima al Zahra and he said to her, O oh daughter of Rasulullah, my condolences to you, O oh Fatima. The soul of your father has departed this world. Everyone cries out in that house, Wa Muhammad. Muhammad 
Imam Amir al Mu'mineen, Sayyidah Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein all cry out, Wa Muhammada. But my dear brothers and sisters, this cry, Wa Muhammada, was not only uttered on the day that Rasulullah left this world. The narration say, brothers and sisters, there's only a 50 year difference from the moment that Hussein was on the chest of Rasulullah and when Shimr was on the chest of Imam al Hussein. The narration say, and on the day of Ashura, when Sayyidah Zainab saw the head of Imam al Hussein on a spear, what did she cry out? She did not cry out, Wa Husayna. She looked at the head of Aba Abdullah and she cried out, Wa Muhammad. She cried out the name Muhammad because the killing of Hussein is the killing of Muhammad. She cries out, Wa Muhammad. Salla alayka maliku sama Hadha Husseinun bil araya Murammalun bil dima Muqabda'u al-a'wa 